And it's important to talk about bounded and centered sets as we lead into the next week, which is about global context. I wonder if you've ever considered whether globalization is good or bad. A lot of times you hear about globalization, it sounds like a bad thing. But just think for a minute. Is globalization a bad thing in terms of spreading the gospel? I don't think so. In the book that you read for this week, this is the, um, the earlier edition of Philip Jenkins' Next Christendom. He says, Far from being an export of the capitalist West, a vestige of Euro-American imperialism, Christianity is now rooted in the Third World, and the re religion's future lies in the Global South. According to Jenkins, the majority world church tends to lean toward these kinds of things. Signs and wonders, Pentecostalism, fundamentalism, conservative lifestyles, activism, and syncretism. Syncretism is when um, the Christian faith is blended with elements of paganism or other religions um, or even um, aspects of the culture that seem to become essentials in that place, but they really aren't. And what they do then is pollute the gospel so that then the gospel isn't just truly the gospel, um, but it's sort of a blend of some other things. Here's an example. And we went to Guatemala to see a celebration during Easter week. In some places, the um, celebration of Easter was mixed with elements of traditional pagan practices. But then on the other hand, we've done this as well. Uh, Western missionaries have gone into places and have um, taught Christianity things that were true, but then have mixed it with a good dose of Westernism where people believed that they had to completely give up their tribal ways, dress and act like North Americans in order to become Christians. The third world church, or the majority world church, I should say, um, according to Jenkins, is well acquainted with poverty and urban decline. Um, a lot of people in in countries that are struggling move to the city, and they move there in search of kind of a, a false promise of opportunity and jobs. Um, they sever ties with their families. They leave home. Maybe they sell everything they have, and they move into cities where they then struggle and suffer and experience a life of isolation um, and wander really without community um, that has seemed so important to them. Um, they're well acquainted with, with this kind of hard struggle of life. They're well acquainted with suffering and oppression, exile and persecution, and even martyrdom. Um, can you imagine the kind of benefit that, that North American Christians could gain from um, worshiping with people who are so well acquainted with suffering um, in living out their faith. They also voice stern critique of the well-fed, complacent, materialistic Western church. As um, Manuel, Manuel Ortiz says, and he has a great book that I've uh, listed here, um, he says, the multi-ethnic global reality inevitably will overtake Christian organizations. We must start thinking anticipatorily as we discern the signs of the future so that we can minister joyfully and not defensively as we embark on a mission that we've received from the Lord. These questions are important as you consider a global context, especially when you consider that the global context is really right here among us right now. Immigration um, has brought the mission field to our door. And we always have said that we have the mission field right at our door, but really in a very, very literal way, the mission field now is right here. It's in the backyards of every church in the United States, just about. And so we have to be ready to communicate with these immigrants and we have to be ready to understand uh, why we draw a boundary when we draw it. And we have to be able to understand why knowledge, allegiance, and power understandings are all very important to their development um, as believers. Here is an example. In our church in Virginia, uh, we had a man who um, was baptized, and um, he said, as he was being baptized, he gave his testimony, and, and he said, you know, I never knew how to pray before, but now I do, and I'm so thankful, now I can talk to God. And he said, um, so when I pray, sometimes I don't know what to say. So I just go on the internet and I Google prayer. 
And when I do that, it brings up all these prayers that I can pray. Well, this man obviously had his allegiance settled with the Lord. He had made a commitment to Christ. He had been a Muslim his whole life, and he'd made a commitment to Christ. He was declaring publicly that his allegiance to Christ had changed. However, he was putting himself in danger spiritually by going on the internet and um, just praying whatever prayers he found out there. And that statement that he made didn't reflect a problem of his heart. It kind of reflected a problem of his training and of his mind. He didn't know yet how really he could talk to the Lord and how he could express what was in his heart. So um, he he may ultimately be led away um, by wrong understanding and by just a simple lack of knowledge about the Christian life, and he needs someone to teach him. So now that he's here, right here in the United States, um, and he may one day be sent back to his home country, or he may choose to go back. But when he goes back, how much better is it for his allegiance to be settled uh, to the Lord, but also his knowledge, so that he can take back a complete gospel uh, to those back in his home country? About the power dimension, maybe some of you weren't quite sure what craft meant by that. Um, So um, we have plenty of other testimonies at our church. We have um, a lot of West Africans at our church. We have Indians and Pakistanis. We have people from uh, many different places in South America at our church. And um, so some things that happen are that people whose allegiance is settled um, and their knowledge is developing, they attend... Sunday school classes or adult education or Bible studies, um, they are committed to reading and memorizing and understanding and applying scripture to their lives. But there's this one sort of secret that that they don't want people to know. Um, and that is that when they encounter a crisis, they are tempted to send money to West Africa um, for their families to go to a shaman or a, or a witch doctor, a traditional healer, they call them. Um, back at home to sort of do some kind of rituals on their behalf to have their problem solved. Um, That's a problem because although their allegiance and knowledge are settled, um, they're opening themselves up to affliction by the enemy of their souls um, when they invite dark powers in to solve the problems of their life. So that's why Kraft calls this, um, this, um, you know, appropriate Christianity, as he calls it. That's why he considers it a three-legged stool and that all these parts have to be solid um, for the believer's life to be balanced. So um, these are the kinds of questions that will come up if you're doing intercultural ministry. So what about um, values for leaders? Do you know that even here in the United States, groups that are not immigrant groups here, um, different groups have different beliefs and standards rooted in the Bible about what qualifies someone for leadership. They read the same scriptures and they apply them differently. Um, how do you know that that um, whether something is, is true or not? Um, what about, what if you had a West African who attended your church and came in with a little bottle of healing water, um, uh, so-called healing water that she'd received from a fiery Nigerian preacher um, who made her pay money to um, go to his conference and receive this holy water, um, this su- supposed blessed water um, that he had then said some words over and sent back. Um, how would you answer when when that woman and her associates um, counter your objections by saying, but you use anointing oil in the service? What about people who are praying for Um, miraculous healings in a way that you become uncomfortable with. How do you know? How do you ever know? What about um, certain practices that you just believe are wrong, but you can't quite put your finger on why you believe they're wrong? Or you have certain practices that, that they believe are wrong, or your church isn't doing something that they think you should be doing. How do you know? What do you do when you have disagreement with other believers like that? Other writers have talked about a world hermeneutical community. Um, a world hermeneutical community um, is an idea that believers 
solid believers from different cultural backgrounds can come together. They can discuss their uh, differences in theology and lifestyle, and they can um, come to an understanding together as they open the Word of God together and find solutions. Um, and so, but these are the kinds of questions that will come up um, as our neighborhoods are becoming more and more diverse. And the best thing that you can do for a group of believers, whether they are believers in your own culture or believers of another culture, the best thing you can do for them, rather than making a pronouncement about what is wrong or right, and people do need guidance, that's why we disciple one another, um, is to enable a group to pick up the Bible for themselves and in community with other believers apply that living word to their lives and to the problems that they face. So the Sierra Leoneans at our church may have issues that come up that I don't, it's so unfamiliar to me culturally that I really don't know what to think about it. I don't know what to say about it. And it would be a mistake for me to make a pronouncement from a distance to tell them, um, you know, and, and assume that it's going to be the final answer that it's wrong what would be better, I can give them my opinion, I can show them the scripture on which I base my view, um, but what is even better is if I enable them to use the Word of God to answer that question in community with one another, um, with the mature believers among them, those who are respected as mature believers among them, um, and ha allow and enable them to um, figure out what the Bible says about it. So these are just some of the, the challenges that we face as we joyfully move forward. This is why it's helpful to understand um, how we develop in context. And that's why I mentioned Bronfenbrenner and also um, this um, difference between centered sets and bounded sets that Hebert mentioned.